Good evening, everyone. Thank you so much for joining me on tonight. I pray to God that you're having a wonderful week. I hope you had a wonderful Easter service. Uh, certainly we did. I, I want to just commend uh, my elder, elders council and my ministerial staff, my, uh, my leadership team for the remarkable job you did in assisting uh, me on the bringing forth our Easter service. So many people were there. I appreciate all of you, all our guests, all our visitors, uh, the saints of God that came out. I pray and hope that you were blessed by the service on this past week. The choir, you did a remarkable job bringing forth the songs of Zion. Thank you so very much. All of the ministries, greeters, ushers, Brenda, y'all did a marvelous job. Ushers, y'all did a marvelous job. Thank you so very much, much. The mothers of the church for greeting and loving our visitors and the saints of God. And to my, my security team, to our knights, to our deacons, the whole nine yards, you guys did an excellent job in the spirit of excellence as we presented our Lord on this past Sunday. Thank you very much and hope to see you back this Sunday now. I hope to see you back this Sunday working on a special word that I believe God is going to uh, give us on, on Sunday. And I pray that you enjoy the word Sunday. I didn't I didn't preach the traditional Easter message on Sunday. God had placed something in my heart, and I'm a stickler for, God, what would you have me to say to your people? And I certainly hope that it helped you and blessed you. Uh, and I'll see you again Sunday. Uh, to all the churches, Houston, all the other churches, thank you so very, 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 very much for your support. Love you guys with all my heart. We're preparing another, uh, and just, you know, Keep this on a wrap, and you're going to be hearing about it soon, another uh, a GT reunion uh, service. And uh, so I'm looking forward to that sometime this spring or this summer. We're going to be putting that together, and you'll be hearing more about it. Uh, okay, so tonight let me go into the Word of God and, and share something that uh, is on my heart and has been on my heart for a few weeks now. Um, and, and when I share with you what it, what it is, you, you know what I'm talking about. You know, I've been talking to you guys, uh, taking liberty to try, not, try to talk to us about the importance of supporting uh, leadership. Your, your pastor, your wife, your, your shepherd, your man of God, your woman of God, you know, uh, whatever labels uh, that you use in your uh, church or your church family uh, for protocol um, I wanted to share something tonight that's, and you know this is burning deep in my heart because I've been trying to get you guys to really understand the importance of undergirding your church and your church family, your pastor, uh, because I'm seeing so many of my brethren and my sisters, uh, uh, they're, they're really, really uh, being challenged right now to stay in, 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 in that office. And, and and I do understand. I know some of you have said things like, uh, uh, you know, how can you uh, step down or how can you not do it when you know God has called you to it? And, and I do understand your perspective, but, uh, you know, they still have families. They still have bills to pay just like you. They got to feed themselves and their families just like you. And, you know, and you say, well, why don't they get a job? Well, how are they going to have a job and you want them to come to the hospital to visit you when you're sick? You want them to counsel you, counsel you when you when you're dealing with issues. You want them to, uh, if you get into a, a hard, you know, in a hard place and need financial assistance, you know, many times those pastors uh, have to go into their own pockets and and go into their uh, their, you know, cookie jar in their own house and and try to help a, a member that's struggling or dealing with a situation more than you can imagine, baby more than you can imagine. And, and I know that, that the carnal mind sometimes, uh, which don't understand spirit, spiritual things because they're spiritually discerned, uh, don't understand many times because I, I just cringe sometimes when, they, when I hear people say negatives about uh, a pastor that may drive a certain vehicle or, or you know, wear a certain uh, level of clothing. You're going to relegate someone that gives their life to you, to a thing. And as though, you know, because he's a pastor, he should just, he or she should just live in, in poverty. And, and you don't feel the same way about a pimp or, or, or a drug dealer or, or even a person that works in corporate. And, and this is the person that spend their life helping people, helping God's people. 
in, in more ways than one, and not just spiritually, y'all. And so I've really tried to convey to you the importance of being mature enough and understand, in understanding the nuances of the, how the church is ran. And a part of the church is that shepherd, is that pastor, y'all. And, and so I, I wanted to share something with you tonight uh, to kind of help you to better understand and maybe silence some demons in your mind or some outside voices that you may be around that may have a negative about uh, your pastor or your shepherd or your man of God, uh, your covering, uh, and and how they are, are, uh, you know, being taken care of. And so let me share this with you. And, and you might need to write this passage of scriptures down. So just in case someone try to get in your ear with something negative, at least you know what the Bible says. And, and this is not Old Testament. This is New Testament, although it's throughout the scripture now. But I want to share with you something out of 1 Corinthians. And this is, this is Apostle Paul. And, and I'm sure everyone that's watching that know the Bible to any degree does consider Apostle Paul to indeed be a man of God, uh, chief apostle. Uh, uh, to say they're great exploits would be an understatement. But, uh, but yet he was dealing with something uh, with the church at Corinth. And, you know, sometimes the empty wagon make the most noise. And, and there were some of that day when the church had been established and, and Paul was having to reap from the benefits of the church being established to feed himself and, and to take care of himself and to go from church to church and city to city and village to village. And, and the church was essentially uh, taking on the responsibility of making sure that he was taken care of and things like that. And there were some in the church at Corinth that had rose up and start taking issue with the fact that uh, he, was, he was receiving, uh, they were giving him offerings and, and blessing him and taking care of him. And that was some of a carnal mind that started to take issue with it. And he addressed it at the church at Corinth. And, and let, me, let me share this with you in hopes of maybe silencing some demons in anybody's mind as it relates to how you and and your church and, and your brothers and sisters, make sure that your pastor, his wife, if necessary, or, or uh, you know, your covering is being covered. OK, so go to First Corinthians chapter number. Chapter number nine. OK, First Corinthians chapter number nine. And, and look at verse number seven. I'm going to start there. It says through, through 14, it says, who goeth a warfare? at any time on his own charges. On, on his own, who go to warfare and he pay to go to war. Soldiers don't pay to go to join the military and, and fight and, and uh, uh, do what they do as, as, as soldiers. The government take care of that. Who go with the warfare at his own charge. And baby, babies, and some of you know this for a fact, uh, this is warfare. Th this is not a cakewalk. Pastoring is hard work. And many times when you are asleep in the bed snoring, your pastor can be walking the floors on your behalf, warring in the spirit, praying for many, hospital after hospital, just the other day, I'm at, at hospital after hospital after hospital, leaving one, going to another, driving all the way across town to go to another one, then leaving there and going across the other side of town to another one to see about my spiritual sons and daughters, to see about members of Gospel Tabernacle. But that's what I do as a pastor, okay? That's pastoring, and it's a part of it. It's not always, but sometimes it is hectic, and sometimes it can be two or three days in a row. Listen to this. Who goeth to warfare at any time at his own charge? Who planteth a vineyard and eateth not of the fruit thereof? Think about that. Who planted a vineyard and not eat of the fruit thereof? You not go plant an apple tree and never eat one of the apples. You're not going to raise cattle and never eat a piece of meat. 
You're not going to raise chickens and never eat an egg and a wing. <laughs> I had a short thought. <laughs> let me get, let me, I <laughs> Let me go. <laughs> I am so sorry, y'all. Yeah, well, yeah, I'm, I'm eating me. A, I'm eating me a couple of wings. Matter of fact, or oh, who feedeth a flock, and eateth not of the milk of the flock? Who? Listen to this. Say I these things as a man, or saith not the law the same also? This wasn't even established here. It was established in the law. And Paul was trying to help them understand this is not new. This has been going on for a length of time. When the woman was getting ready to eat her last morsel of meal and die, the man of God said, make me a cake first. And she did. Long story, and her cupboard never, ever went dry again. It is the method that God chooses to bless his people. Give unto the prophet in the name of the prophet, then you receive the prophet's reward. Let me read some more. Listen to this now, verse number nine. For it is written in the law of Moses, thou shalt not listen to this, because this is important to the, to the text. Thou shalt not Muzzle the mouth of the ox that treaded out the corn. Thou shalt not muzzle the ox. You don't put a muzzle on the mouth of an ox that he won't eat from the corn of the field that he's plowing. You have no problem with that because you want that ox to maintain strength. And the capacity to continue to plow the field. And so if the ox needs food, if the ox needs strength, if the ox needs nourishment, you want the ox to partake of the field that he's plowing so he will maintain the strength to keep on doing what he's doing. Same thing in the spirit realm. When it comes down to your spiritual father or mother, you want them to, 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 to reap from the labor that they're putting in the kingdom, that they're putting in the church, so they can maintain the strength to, con- to continue to plow, to continue to feed, to not be stressed by helping everybody else maintain themselves, and then they're going down the drain fast. Helping you to keep a roof over your head and don't have one over theirs. You're coming in dressed and looking a certain kind of way, and then there are some that expect them to look like they're borderline homeless. That is terrible. And it's not Bible, baby. And it's not Bible. And it's, you should want your covering. You should want your covering. Have They're your pattern. They're your example. How can I convince you that God can bless your life, that God will prosper you, and I'm looking like I ain't got a quarter? Think about that. Consider that. How can I convince you that God will bless you, that God will prosper you, that God will increase you? And baby, this this message tonight, this teaching tonight, it is not about me. Let me get that straight before I go any further. This is not about me. I'm trying to help you. I'm trying to help you. God has blessed my life. I travel all across the country preaching. Uh, I'm blessed where I go. I have a church that loves me dearly. And they don't have issue. They have been taught. They have been taught. They know the word of God and they don't take issue. And they are blessed. Our church is blessed. The people in it are blessed. The people in it are prospering. The whole nine yards. You come to Gospel Tabernacle, you don't see people walk around in poverty. And I'm not saying that to demean anyone. I'm just saying how blessed we are, and we're proud of it. And and we're proud of it. I have some blessed sons and daughters. Okay, so this is not about me. This is me trying to help you to understand the importance of making sure you understand that it is not anti-Bible and don't allow anyone to get in your ear gate and convince you that just because 
you, know, you are blessing and covering your man and woman of God, or they are even blessed for, for what they do, laboring in the kingdom, businesses, whatever they do, it is the will of God and it is biblically based. Okay, let's go a little further. I'm not going to take long tonight, but listen to this. Back at number nine again, it is written in the law of Moses, thou shalt not muzzle the ox, or shalt, or shalt thou not muzzle the mouth of the ox that treaded out the corn? Same way, listen to this. Verse number 10, or saith he it, it altogether for our sakes? For our sakes, no doubt, this is written that he that ploweth should plow in hope. And that he that thresheth in hope should be partaker of the hope. You don't want your leader to labor to bring hope to you. That God is going to bless you. Hope to you that your life can increase. Hope to you that you can be a representative of the kingdom and be blessed and have and live and prosper and thrive. But yet... They can't. But yet they can't. And you're allowing someone to convince you of that. You wouldn't, you shouldn't want your, your pastor, your shepherd, your leader to pour into you and then God bless your life and, and increases your life. And then you're living high on the hog. You're driving, you know, a certain level of automobile. And I mean a level. And then your leader, your pastor drive up <laughs> in a cloud of smoke. Think about that, y'all. Think about that. And I certainly don't. I want my pastor. Oh, God. <laughs> and I've been like that since I've been saved. And if, if, if anyone, you talk to anyone, brother, that have known me for a number of years, they will verify this. They will sustain what I, I'm what I just said about me, since I have been saved, I have always worked in the kingdom for years. And when I say for years, I'm talking about for years, 40, 50, so years. I have made sure that my pastor, his wife, his family was covered, was taken care of. They had, if, if they needed, I went out of my way to rally the church the members, what have you, to be a blessing to them, to help them. I wanted them to live a certain way. I want them to live in a certain wise. I wanted them to drive a certain way. I wanted them to look a certain way, wear a certain, because they were my patterns. They were my examples. That's where I draw my strength. That increases my faith because when I see them, it helps me to stand on the word of the promises of God's word to do it for me. They were my examples. So me watching and seeing God moving their lives on that wise, it gave me the faith and the trust and the belief that he was going to do it for me and could do it for me and he would do it for me and he has done it for me and is doing it for me. And I want to be a pattern <clears throat> and an example to my spiritual sons and daughters that they see me as an example to trust God even the more. Yes, I do. Yes, I do. And because they have been taught, they understand that. And they will tell you in a heartbeat, oh, no, that's my father. I want my father to have because he's my example. He helps me to believe God to do things in my life. Let me go a step further now. Verse number 11, we're just about there. If we have sown, listen to this now. This is Paul talking to the church at Corinth. Listen to what he said to them, and I want to say it to you. He said, if we, talking about those who were of the leaders, the leaders in the establishing of the early church, if we have sown unto you spiritual things, check it out now. If we have sown unto you spiritual things, is it a great thing if we shall reap your carnal, carnal things? If we sown unto you spiritual things, if we've placed in you the spirit of faith through preaching, 
through teaching and we've made these deposits in you that you start to believe in yourself and believe that you can do certain things and believe that you can accomplish through the word of God, through the preaching, through the teaching, through the words that's coming out of your man of God's spirit. And it provokes you to go out and become and elevate your life and establish your family and have for your family and move up any ladder and walk through certain doors through God's word and your pastor, your man of God has been putting that in your spirit and impregnating that in your spirit and making those kind of deposits in your spirit and it provoked your faith to believe God that you could walk through certain doors and sit at certain tables. Think about that. And he's provoked you to take your life to another level in level sometimes that you didn't even consider or think that you had the capacity or the abilities to do, to accomplish, to become. And your pastor, your leader provoked that in you and spoke that in you and prophesied that over you, spoke that into your life, spoke that into your family. And God began to do it. And you begin to stand on the promise, the prophetic utterances that your man and woman of God uh, made unto you. And now look at you now. And then you won't then just have nothing. Because someone of a carnal mind has convinced you that they're supposed to live in poverty because they're a pastor. Don't you allow that frame of mind, that kind of carnal mindness, mindness to convince you to believe such rhetoric. And here again, let me reemphasize, just in case somebody's listening and think Satan has sat on your shoulder <clears throat> and told you that I'm saying this because of me. Click him off. Because this ain't got nothing to do with me. This has everything to do with anybody that may watch this teaching at any point to help them to understand the importance of covering your head. your man, and your woman of God. Let me go a step further here. Listen to this. If we have sown unto you, again, spiritual things, is it a great thing if we shall reap your carnal things? Three more verses. If others be partakers of this power over you, are not we rather? Or not we if someone else can get in your ear and convince you contrary and get you out of the will of God and get you thinking differently or contrary to what God has said, or putting you in a in a in an awkward position that now you can get out of the will of God, or put yourself in a position that you can close a door, put yourself in a position that would be displeasing to God. And now the blessings that God had prepared and stored up for you because of the prophetic utterances, because of what your man and woman of God has spoken in your spirit. And now <clears throat> you have allowed someone of a carnal mind, <clears throat> a person who is not aware of what God's word says. And you've allowed them to convince you to make a decision that has got you out of the will of God, gotten you out of the will of God, and can perhaps nullify what God was preparing to do in your life. And, and you know what, Blake Babies, let me, let me take that off the table because I'm not even wanting to go that far. I'm not even wanting to bring that to the table right now. I'm just talking about doing it because it's right and doing it because of what it can ultimately do in your life and do it because of what it has done in your life. I, I take great pride in my spirits and sons and daughters. How many times, oh God have mercy, how many times, young to old, I have some of the, the, my grand spiritual grandsons and daughters. Oh, God Almighty. I mean blessed, super young, supervised degrees, doctors, nurses, 
Some of them in college right now studying to be attorneys. I have one right now in the University of Texas, full ride, studying because he want to be a politician. Matter of fact, matter of fact, I believe he could be the next Barack Obama. And this is because he was convinced through the preaching of the gospel. He was convinced. His mother was convinced. Poured into his life. He was, he was set on the edge of the seat. Didn't want to go to children's church because he didn't want to miss a word that the, the prophet was saying. And right now, I believe from the depths of my heart, he could literally be the next president or one, a future president, should I say, of the United States of America. And that's a biased statement, but it's biasly true. And his example was his pastor. His, his pastor. If I'm walking around, uh, your pastor's walking around looking like God has not done much for him, what kind of hope is that? How's that going to give you hope? How's that going to provoke you or convince you to believe God to bring your life to a certain level? And it looked like you're a man of God. It's not being brought to a certain level. I've been in this thing almost 50 years. All this time, I should look like God has done something for me. I would have a difficult time. In this thing all this time, and it does not look like God has done very much for me, I would have a real issue with that if I was a follower. Consider what I'm saying. Now listen, I'm just about to listen to the rest of this now. Again, if others be partakers of this power over you, are you not rather? Nevertheless, we have not used this power but suffer all things, lest we should hinder the gospel of Jesus Christ. Yes, we go through just like you. We have challenges just like you. Your pastor does, whole nine yards. But we've been an example for you in every way. And so we should exemplify the other two. To be the pattern that you can follow. Two more verses and I'm out. Listen to the last two verses. Do ye not know that they which minister about holy things live of the things of the temple? This is Paul talking. This is not Bishop David Martin. This is not T.D. Jakes. This is not some uh, bishop of the age. This is not doctor this or evangelist this. This is not prophet this. This is the Apostle Paul in your Bible that you consider to be, indeed be a man of God. I'm just about there. Listen to the rest of it. And I'm trying to help you all I really am trying to help y'all that you can silence the demons and certainly any externals that may be trying to speak to your head. Do you not know that they which minister about holy things live of those things of the temple and they which wait at the altar are partakers with the altar? Are partakers with the altar. Church is our life. Pastoring in our life. It's not just something we're doing on a whim. And I know it's that way for me. I didn't start pastoring because of money or wanted to drive a certain. I didn't even want a pastor. I ran from pastoring big time because I saw what my pastor was dealing with. Because I was his covering. I was his armor bearer before armor bearer was even a thing. I covered him and I saw what he was going through and I didn't want any parts of it. And then I saw how people could be. <laughs> the saints can be ants. <laughs> yeah, the saints can be some ants, Jack. 
And I would see what he would be dealing with and uh, the leaders would be dealing with. I didn't want any parts of pastoring at all, babies. Oh, at all. And sometimes even now I think, what were you thinking about? Because I was doing good. I was moving up the corporate ladder, making six-figure salary in the 80s. In the 80s, babies. So I didn't start pastoring for a dollar because the uh, uh, church started with, um, you know, just a handful of people. And there was no way they could pay me what I was making. Not even close. So I didn't start pastoring for a dollar or for a check. I started pastoring because God essentially threatened my life. What he said in essence, quote, unquote, tears running down my face. He said, do it or die. And that's tough. That's heart-wrenching for God to say that to you. And he, he didn't raise his voice. That was a small, still voice. But I knew it was him. He said, do it or die. And I laid on that floor and wailed. I cried myself to sleep. I was crushed because I just didn't want to do it. And finally, after much deliberation, I yielded to the will of God concerning me. And I was still working. I had 66 employees working under me in corporate America that I was accountable for. I'm responsible for, rather. They started a, a night shift. And because there was no supervisor, I had to uh, do my shift and get the other shift started and leave at two or three hours in so I can go home and get ready to come back the next day. I had to be at work at 5 o'clock. And I was pastoring. And I was pastoring. But the church started to grow so that the demand was so great that I had no choice. I had no choice. And then we started going to multiple services. Uh, it was just too much. And so I had to. I was forced to. But it wasn't a decision made because I wanted the church to take care of me. I wanted the church to buy me this or buy me that. I bought my own stuff. But when I had to go full time, were they to muzzle the ox that was treading out all this corn and watching all these lives change and watching all these people be blessed on this wise and elevated on this wise and promoted on this wise and, and God blessing them on this level and on that level and, and the kids doing this and the kids going to college here and the, the kids and all this and then he looked like he's in poverty. Think about that. That makes absolutely no sense. But yet, there are some of you who are allowing people to convince you that that's the way it should be. Let me close. Last scripture. And I didn't want to preach this. I just wanted you to hear my heart. Even so hath the Lord ordained, listen to this, that they, listen to him, they which preach the gospel should live of the gospel. These are not Bishop Martin's words. This is the Bible. God said, don't add or take away. We can't pick and choose which parts of the Bible that we're going to adhere to. Either you're going to yield to the word of God, what we label the word of God, or you're not. And I made that decision years ago that I would yield to it. And I made sure that out of my own pockets and I provoked the worshipers of our church, church that I came out of, to undergird and support our leader and his family. And we did. And many of us has gone on to great things. Many of us, God, has enriched and blessed our lives immensely. And I was an intricate part of that and proud of it. And so I just wanted to share that. I know this is not the typical Bible study, but it is Bible study. And this, this is in the Bible. And I wanted to teach that to you tonight. And so let me just reiterate. Take care of your man and woman of God. Take care of them. 
help cover your church. And I guarantee you, I promise you, make no mistake about it, you will reap from that. The Bible says, be not deceived, God is not mocked whatsoever. A man soweth, that shall he also reap. That shall he also reap. Many people want God to bless them with large sums of money, and you sow it sparingly. So many of us want a, a million dollar return, so in three dollar trinity they're offering. You reap what you sow, and by the measure that you sow so it, if you sow it, the Bible says if you sow it sparingly or little, you get back little. God has blessed my life, but talk to anyone that knows Bishop Martin. Very few God give me. Huh. Now, God knows that's the truth. Kenneth Sullivan, Minister Kenneth Sullivan will say that's the black truth. <laughs> oh, very few God sold me. That's why I don't allow people when God starts to bless me, you know, to get to me with negativity. I'm reaping what I've sown. And so continue to bless your house of worship. Cover your man of God, and God will cover you. So if you're watching or shall watch in days to come, sow a special seed into your church, in the life of your man and woman of God. Don't walk by them all the time. Sometimes walk by them and put something in their hand. You'd be surprised. You would be shocked how appreciative and many times how needed it is. I have a deacon. His name is Deacon, deacon David Gibson. Every now and then he'll just come and hug me. And it may not be a lot to some. And it's not a whole lot of money, you know. But he'll just fold up a $100 bill and put it in my hand. He don't have to do that. And he and his wife are one of the two of the blessed members or blessed families in our entire church. Cover your man and woman of God. It's Bible. Hope you've enjoyed tonight. I hope this has been helpful, helpful, helpful to you tonight. And I will see you next week. Good night. I want to go deeper. I want to go further. I want to go higher than I
become complacent. Never stop pursuing you. 